collecting for funding and scholarships, minefields, and opportunities. I think this is very clear enough because um, everything is about funding, it's about scholarships. What are the opportunities there? What are the threats? What are the challenges? So the idea is to play on the metaphor of the field that you are very well familiar with, mining, geophysical studies, and all of that. I have I have 10 subheadings for this presentation, where, whereas in some cases, the subheading could have multiple slides, uh, but the main headings are to, to talk about what grant writing is, which many of us know, uh, funding and uh, scholarships, and then African women in scholarship. And then we we'll talk about the minefields, what I call the minefields. Uh, then from six and seven, I think this will probably be the heart of my presentation. Why do proposals fail? And how to prepare a proposal for funding and scholarship. And then we'll touch on some opportunities, some uh, resources and valuable sites, especially of the active one, right, as I speak. And then I will conclude with some points to note. So as I said, uh, it's a very simple stretch. Now, the purpose of the lecture, again, is to find scholarships, to talk about funding of scholarships. And then actually, it's about mining funding, uh, the, the idea of mining, searching for, and prospecting for scholarships, which itself is what I call a geophysical canon. Um, and what? We have in the next few slides will be what I refer to as a general imaging of possibilities. So uh, in short, what is grant writing? Grants, simply they are monetary awards. They are not refundable in most cases. They are not repayable as long as the funding is uh, appropriately utilized for the purpose for which uh, it was uh, received. And in overall, it aids, especially for African scholars, especially for scholars in the third world, without, grant, without grants, without funding, intellectual advancement would be like a mirage. So it contributes to intellectual uh, advancement and socioeconomic development of society. But this won't be possible without an understanding of the different forms of grant proposals, of the various ways by which this grant writing can be domesticated. Again, here, I say that grants are not awarded simply because and applicants need the grant. You know, it's not because an applicant needs a grant. And it is meant to produce a work of sustained research. And in order to write a fundable proposal, one must learn some skills and some procedures as we move on in any, in any area of intellectual endeavor that we find ourselves, we have to learn some skills and procedures. But then there are different types of grants. And there are things to know about these grants. They have different nature. They serve different purposes. The first is that certain, fund, certain funding are solicited, some are unsolicited. In most cases, what we do is that we do both. We, 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 we search out for that which is solicited, and without being solicited, we also go prospecting for funding. And there are different kinds of um, funders. There are institutional funders, 
there are agencies, there are corporations, there are foundations, there are religious bodies also. Uh, what we could add is professional bodies. There are also professional bodies that serve the purpose of providing funding for researchers. So a researcher should be aware of the status of the funder, of the prospective funder. And then grants serve different needs. There are project grants. There are grants meant to purchase equipment. There are grants meant to attend conferences, like travel grants. There are fellowship grants that go between three months, six months, or one year. Some can even stretch as, as, as long as four years. There are basic research grants. There are residency research grants, and so on and so forth. And there are three main modes of these grants. One could apply for grants individually. One could apply with two, three others to serve as a group, as a team. In most cases, in geophysical sciences, in mining, research, in most cases, the likelihood is that you're going to work as a group where there will be a PI. And also there are institutional modes where whole departments or interconnection of scholars from various Hello, disciplines. You. you guys screw our door let the field open again. Kitchen Hello. Door. Can I go on? So there are different modes, individual, group, or team, and institutional. But if we know different kinds of grants, we also should know the various categories of scholars. And in this case, my focus is on African women in scholarship. Or shall we even say specifically Nigerian women in, in scholarships? There are early career scholars. There are mid-career scholars, um, otherwise sometimes known as postdoc. And there are experienced scholars. But what interests me from researcher or scholar is women scholars in this case, and much more specifically Nigerian or African women scholars. Um, some time ago, um, a funding agency known as the Humboldt Foundation um, noted, observed the underrepresentation of women, especially when it comes to award grants, scholarships, funding. And so they made that special, uh, uh, they gave spe that special attention to the needs of women scholars. So I would uh, recommend. Uh, that uh, my audience should search out about the Humboldt Foundation, especially if uh, we don't know about it or we've not heard about it before. And this is what the AVH said. Uh, in the sponsorship and award programs, which target researchers at very advanced stages of their careers, women are underrepresented. And what to add is that it is not only women in advanced stages of their career, there are young female scholars who do not have the opportunity that their male counterparts have. And we'll get to some of the reasons uh, militating against the advancement of women's uh, scholars uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the African society. So now specifically again, we speak of uh, earth sciences, uh, African women earth sciences, mining, geology, and so on. I mean, uh, to note, there are various subfields and all these subfields expect a certain form of competence of scholars without differentiating whether they are women or whether they are men. The first thing, the first condition is competence. The second uh, 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 condition is qualification. And then eligibility can come forth after that. So I note here that it is not only by gender, but 
by discipline and competence. Of all these various sub-disciplines of mining and, 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 and geoscience, it is important for the potential fund-seeking scholar to have a certain competence, to have that qualification, yeah, that particular discipline, and to have produced certain work that commands some kind of attention so that when it comes to eligibility, when it comes to the opportunity for that female scholar, it will be easy dealing with other um, requirements. So, perhaps we could just go to what I refer to as minefields. And minefields here is my uh, simple metaphor referencing drawbacks, challenges, threats. And in this kind of projects, in geological mining and esca other excavatory projects, there are prospects. There will be risks as well as fines. And I note that it is the nature of scholarly research project, projects, not only in the uh, uh, in geosciences or mining, that there will be blind sides, there will be booby traps, there will be cool de sacs, there will be threats and challenges. And so the prospecting fund seeking researcher should be aware of this. Now, my next slide will indicate some of the gender specific challenges that um, have been noted. One, there's a limitation of the number of female mentors. I'm, 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 I'm sure uh, the group uh, is actually established in order to expand the scope, the number, to break down the barriers, the limitation for female mentors. But right now, there is a limitation for female mentors. There are competing family responsibilities for the woman. The woman is usually at the receiving end compared to the man when it comes to scholarly opportunities. In some other regions, maybe not in the southern part of the country, there are religious limitations that militate against the, the advancement of, of women researchers. But above all, there is that general cultural stereotype of the woman as domestic hand, as the supporter, as the, as the read by the side of the man, or at best, as the human complement to the male. These are some of the factors militating against the advancement of women. Uh, as we move, but in general, general, because what I've said earlier is the specific ones, cultural, religious limitations, uh, limited number of, um, of mentors, uh, but there is the general limitation, the general mind feeds experience of most scholars, whether male or female, we delay. Many of us procrastinate. Some of us do not have information about resources available in our uh -huh. fields. Some of us find it difficult to find contact, uh -huh. to connect beyond our scope, beyond our universities. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I want our to our go. And then the practical point that some of us find difficulty in engaging with how to prepare application packages. So these are the general and the specific mind feeds as I add it in mind. Now, why do proposals fail? There are about eight reasons adduced Seven ideas for why proposals fail. The first, and I'm quoting from earlier work done, the proposal lacks focus and a clearly defined plan of work. Two, the budget requests excessive funds. Three, the proposal does not make clear the audience which will utilize the results of the completed project. And four, the PI, that is the applicant, does not seem qualified to do the project which she proposes. 
And then the other reasons why proposals fail, the computer aspects of the project are not clearly de delineated. Now, reference to computer aspect is about research design. What is expected? What is the structure? What is going to be the presentation format of your research project? If it is not clearly defined, it becomes befuddled. And among many other competing applications, it will be put aside. Next, the principal investigator does not display awareness of recent research in the field. That is currency. The PI and even other investigators must be current. They must be aware of development in that field. And seven, in general, the proposal fails to make clear the principles of selection. or compilation. That is justification for these. Apologies for that break in transmission, but I say that this actually is the heart of my discussion. And, and this is just that time that prospecting became difficult. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, earlier before now, I've already talked about uh, what funding is, different kinds of funding, different kinds of funders, different kinds of scholars, the challenges, especially that are gender specific and that are general. And I also spoke about proposal, the, important, the importance of knowing how to do a proposal and knowing the focus. I listed about seven, yes, yeah, seven reasons why proposals fail. Now, the to prepare pro a proposal, there are certain blocks, there are certain points, there are certain milestones to attain to prepare a proposal. In preparing the proposal, one must be able to answer the question of need. Why, why is there a need for this research? And what are the goals and the objectives? The goals are the long-term vision and the objectives are the specific uh, focus. They are the specific points to attain. I used the word project design earlier. Apart from introduction and need, we need also to be aware that every project must have its design. Technically, structurally, there must be a project design. What is the methodology? What are the illustrations that we are going to use in this proposal? And what are the expected research outcomes? And how will the project be executed? This falls under project design. But the area that many of us take lightly is the budget area. When they say budget, they do not just talk about figures, but they also mean narration. Narration. Not just about calculating the figures, but we have to have what is called a budget narrative. And so that budget narrative would be the aspect that will answer the question, how will the budget fit the demands of my project? Why am I spending this much? Why am I buying this much of material? Why am I committing so much amount of money to this particular item? There must be a narrative for it. There must be a narrative and a realistic basis of calculation between design and the timeline that one is going to use for this particular research. So to prepare the proposal, introduction and need, project design and budget. There are, broadly speaking, 
for academic for all academic research endeavor for most proposers, whether in the humanities, in the social sciences, in the sciences, geophysical sciences, there are usually two broad options. Sometimes we take one option, sometimes we combine two options according also according to the demands, the requirement of the fund. Sometimes they set a plan. They set out a number of points in the form for what for, for us to feel. But this usually is the sequence for option one. There will certainly be an abstract. Sometimes they will say a hundred words, sometimes they will say 150 words. Please, if they say 150 words, do not write 150.5 words. Do not write 151 words. If you write 151 words, the likelihood is that the proposal will not get read because that is the first point. And then the needs statement, statement of the problem or the motivation for the research, the goal of that research, then the method, project design, then expected outcomes, then budget. But the, your proposal is not complete if you do not, whether you are asked or not. Your proposal is not complete until you indicate how you will disseminate the result. They are not giving the funding, they are not giving the money just for you to publish in an obscure journal. They are giving money for you to be able to publish an impact not only in your immediate sphere of research, but also the larger society, especially in the physical uh, sciences, in the geophysical sciences, you have a greater advantage to impact on the society. And so it shouldn't be difficult to be able to say how, to note how I'm going to disseminate my result. And of course, on the right-hand side is the second option, which is more like for those in the social sciences and the humanities. So I will not belabor the point to speak much on this. Um, of preparing a proposal. What are the demands of preparing a proposal? One, allow enough time. We, this cannot be said much. Two, follow the guidelines. Without the guidelines, one will fall into traps. And the guidelines will be provided by the agency, not the guideline that's provided by your mentor or by the one that you have created yourself. In order to make the proposal readable, you are not going to write a long essay. You are going to write short and crisp paragraphs interspersed with facts, figures, possibly references, but mainly use major and minor headings in the narrative of your proposal. And I said earlier that there's a difference between goals and objectives. Goals are the global one, they are the more inclusive. And the objectives are the immediate achievement that we expect. So continuing with the preparing preparation of the proposal, I've already stated something about goals. If you look at the objectives on the right hand side of the screen, um, if you have a statement like this, by September 30, 2025, we plan to increase the number of geoscience education workshops delivered in the community from five to 10 per chapter. A statement like this is a clear pointer to the objective of the proposal. So, um, I have I have a uh, a manual which I call the A to Z of pro proposal writing, and under P, I said that P is for preparation, P is for proposal, and P is for presentation. Again, it's important to emphasize that we need this emphasis on structure, on order, 
on innovation. You have to write a proposal, you have to compose a proposal that is competing with others. It is not just an essay for publication that once it meets the average line, then it will pass. But this one is not a paper for an article for publication. This one is an article of promise, idea, which must be essentially innovative. Presentation is almost everything. Presentation is almost everything. So obviously, without creative and innovative ideas, no viable proposal can be written. On the other hand, even the most creative ideas must be properly packaged in a well-organized grant proposal to obtain the hearing they deserve. And so keep it simple, specific, immediate, measurable, practical, logical, and evaluable. Uh, we can extend on this, but I will skip this and then we go to um, what do grantors consider? For those who had, of course, written several proposals who have won, and uh, maybe along the line have not really got close to winning. And for those who are just coming on board, grantors have their own mind. There's a psychology of the grantor. The grantor wants to know, does this project fulfill a need? Does it serve a purpose? What is the credibility of the applicants? And that is true qualification true visibility and what is the sustainability of this project is it sustainable they want to know about the experience of the applicant that is about credibility of the applicant what is the experience of the ap applicant as evidence in his in his in our past activities especially since they were, they are going to ask you to provide previous work done or, or experience in the field. Now, the proposal in itself, is it rigorous? Is it innovative enough? And is the idea in that proposal unique? Is it precise and complete on its own? Is it novel? And finally, does the applicant follow the instructions, especially as provided in the eligibility requirements and procedure for writing the, for making that application? Does the applicant follow the instructions to the letter? So this, in a nutshell, is how grantors operate when our work goes before the panel. Now, what should applicants consider? What should we consider? The first is to look at the call for proposal and be sure that the project meets the mission and goals of the grantor. Also, we need to be sure that this particular call covers us qualifies us to participate. If they say it is for African women scientists below 40 years, if you are 40 years, it means that you do not qualify. They say below 40 years. If you are 40 years, you do not qualify. Does the project meet the funding priorities identified for the year? Some grantors decide on particular themes and topics per year. So they will choose a particular topic. They will choose certain priorities within the year and you find out whether it meets. And then what sort of institutions or individuals have been funded? It's also important for you to go to the web page of these funding agencies. Most funding agencies now have web, web pages. So even before you set pen to paper at all, read about them, check them out profile them. If, if they are kind of work 
is usually quantitative, do not attempt a qualitative research work you know, for that application. And number four, do I have a realistic budget? Is the budget realistic enough? As I said, the budget will be realistic if embedded within it, we have a budget description. If you are going to use certain reagents for three months and the cost for a month is $1,000, it means that you cannot write beyond $3,000 there. The moment you write $5,000, the, there will be a red flag. So the budget description will help uh, in the propagation of the possibility of that proposal. Now, finally, as the description of timeline and activity explained why the cost is needed. Of course, this also is connected to budget description. The timeline will determine, I already explained that earlier. Now, when we now speak of opportunities, going back to our uh, extended method, by opportunity, we mean treasures that are foundable, touchstones that we can find, gems from the research. And I note that in recent times, especially in the 21st century, most funding agencies are now aware and they are taking into account the issue of the underrepresentation of the female in scholarship. So there is that attention, there is that gesture towards gender equity and equal opportunity in scholarship. So that is good news for women in Nigerian mining and geosciences. So the possible justification for gender specific criteria, in addition to earlier statement, is that all categories of women scholars are impacted on, they are impacted upon by genocentric matters at various at different levels of their development, whether early career, experienced, middle career, postdoc. Uh, research has shown that for some scholars, the postpartum state is associated uh, to decline in research productivity. And that is why some funding agencies, uh, especially, for instance, the uh, as Alexander Paul Umboldt Foundation that I mentioned, have special programs that will um, allow women that will, that will be solely uh, uh, be a space for women, for women scholars. Now, the resources and valuable sites. Um, uh, these are sites that I, um, I sought out specifically for Nigerian women in mining and, geo, and the geosciences. And these are existing scholarships, opportunities that are still open some up till the end of, of September, some till October, some till November. So um, I would just implore uh, members of the audience, those who are interested to check uh, about eight of them. There is International Scholarships for African Women, 2023 to 2024. There is a African-American uh, University Women International Fellowships in the USA for Women. Now, when, we, when they say USA, it doesn't mean that it is not open to other scholars. Actually, if it is possible to check, um, now, if you can see this, the information here, the deadline, the deadline is um, 15th of November, and the brief description is that the American Association of University Women awards international fellowships for full-time study or research in the United States to women who are not United States citizens or permanent residents, who are not United States citizens or permanent residents. And uh, it is open to both graduates and post-graduate studies. So I will implore that we, we, check, we check this out. I will maybe check one or two more. Um, is there a post for African women, 2023, 20, 20, 2024? 20, and, and there's also the Aurora Tech Award Prize for women uh, founders. This might also be 
uh, uh, a material of interest. And here, okay, now the, the, the question is here, uh, if you're a woman entrepreneur and your project has improved the lives of a larger number of people, then don't delay, submit an application today. Um, the goal is to support women in the fields of advanced technologies, especially women entrepreneur. Okay. Okay, let's let's check four others. There is the VCLA fully funded uh, motivated scholarship, which is in Austria. There is a Carlton University Queen Elizabeth scholarship for African students. 2023, when they say students, it also means graduate students. And this particular scholarship is the one that is closing very, very soon. I think it's closing um, let me see. I think it's about September 20. It's closing 20. So it's um, it covers accommodation expenses, travel, and all of that. So that one is just a week, a week away from here. And then um, there is an Alliance for African Partnership, African Features Research Leadership Program for Early Career Women Researchers. This one is for mainly early career scholars. And then the, the last one is for uh, women leaders. And this particular one is fully funded Asia is in Japan. So these and many more, I mean, once you're able to click on one, it can lead you to other sites. Now there are points to note, and I have three slides left. Uh, uh, the points to note are divided into three parts, six on each slide, and I refer to them as 18 points to note uh, for the prospective fund seeking scholar or researcher. Allow ample time for planning and writing your proposal. Always attempt at achieving clarity and, and uh, conciseness. Avoid jargons and excessive use of acronyms. If you must use acronyms, explain them. Write them in full first before you go to use the acronyms. Four, provide the definitions of specific terms at first mention. Create headings directly from the review of criteria provided. From what is provided, create headings for them. And when you are creating adding, use bold, underline, or italic for notations. Seven, provide a timeline and submit your application timelessly. Ensure that you have a realistic budget. I said that earlier. We cannot but emphasize that. Embed the budget description in the proposal narrative. Present outcomes to be both measurable and inventive. We have to show that there is going to be research outcomes from this project. And especially, uh, you know, for your field, you need to use tables, figures, lists, charts, graphs effectively in order to communicate data. And try to use third-person narrative when possible, but avoid use of different pronoun styles. Be specific, be orderly. And the final slide, share the proposal with colleague before submission for editorial and logic check. Describe a plan for continuing the proposed program after the grant funds are expended. Funders are usually um, impressed when you also tell them, show to them that your program will continue even at the expiration of the grant funds. Remember that one often does not get funded on the first attempt. So for especially for early career scholars listening to me, if you do not get funded on the first attempt, it means that you're on the right path. Uh, in most cases, first attempts usually fail because you need to learn. So when you fail the first time, you can be sure that the second or third time, you're going to win that price. And understand that ejection or rejection does not mean condemnation of your ability, but always, possibly, even when you are rejected or when your application is, uh, is denied, always request comments of the reviewers. Usually the reviewers are also, they are also human beings, but they are, they are blindsided. They are not supposed to be known. They are anonymous. 
but you can actually request for the reviewer's comments in order to aid you as you move along in your field, as you prospect as a researcher. And of course, deadline dates, they are very, very important. There are certain scholarships that, that are year round, that have deadlines. For instance, the, the average scholarship is year round, March, June, October, and then goes round again. Uh, the Fulbright scholarship is usually February and June, and then February, March, and June again. So it's important to note some, especially for future opportunities. But of course, you have to search. One keeps searching uh, to be able to find. One keeps prospecting to be able to find. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. This was really insightful. And I want to believe that all the audience, they, they, they picked something from today's lecture. We are very, very grateful. So on behalf of um, women in NMGS, we say thank you, a very big thank you to you. It was really resourceful. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon. everybody. And uh, good afternoon to our presenter. I really want to appreciate the women in geosciences for this opportunity. And my question goes like, looking at the current trend, everything is going green. And for us to achieve uh, the trend of establishing by 2030 the rate of green energy that will be required, a certain amount of ion, a uh, certain amount of cobalt, is going to be mined. So I don't know if there are maybe scholarships or grants that are focused on directing or encouraging this mining capacity. Because looking at the uh, value, looking at statistics, we'll see that the amount of uh, iron or cobalt to be mined by 2030 in order to achieve that green energy is near about 80% of what has already been mined since around 1930. So you see that we are driving into a green and sustainable energy, but which is focused on mining, especially on rare earth elements. So I don't know if there is a, if our facilitator. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, I, I don't, I really doubt if the question is for our lecturer today, our guest lecturer today, because it's not coming from the mining sector. Although if he has something to say with, uh, to that regard, he will still say that. But um, we have professors in the house, professors of geoscience in the house. So if they have any um, answer to your question, I think they can also indicate to answer. In the absence of no, no other question, I think we'll be taking the closing remark because our time is fast spent. So Dr. Oge, you have the floor for the closing remark, please. Okay, thank and you. Are sorry, when you are done, um, if Professor Umeji, our mom is here, she will also give us a closing remark on behalf of the chapter too. So. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chinene. My special thanks will have to go to Professor Aderemi Raji, really. Thank you so much, Prof, for spending time with us. Thank you so much for releasing such a full package seminar to all. I'm sure that as many that have joined us gained quite a lot that will either help their writing skill for those that are yet to start, and for those that have been doing that, I'm sure there are one or two areas where they pick up one or two to improve. We are so grateful for your time. Mm -hmm. My thanks to also go to every one of us. We had uh, uh, more than 20 participants, and it's quite encouraging. I want to say thank you all for always looking out for our webinars and for always joining us. God bless you all. I'm sure we have learned a lot. 
from writing the grant, from being specific, from uh, 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 knowing the minds of the funders and being able to align ourselves to the purpose and objective of the grants. I'm sure we have learned a lot and thank you all for joining us. Okay, thank you very much. So before um, our mommy, Professor Meiji comes up, please, um, let's just take this from Abdul Wahab. He has been raising his hand. Unfortunately, I didn't see it earlier on. So please, Abdul Wahab, just give the question so that Professor Raji can answer before we we'll wrap up finally. Uh, thank you, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the uh, impactful discussion. So, I don't know, I came late, but the little I met is part of what I'm expecting. You made mention about the proposal and what the uh, grantors need to see from the proposal. I want to use myself as an example. I am uh, a graduate applicant, especially focusing at USA precisely. And uh, I can say I've been in this part for a year now. And uh, I've seen some, I've sent a lot of applications and I've been getting some rejection. I've been getting some admissions to their fundings. I am an HMB holder from the Protege Kibaden. I graduated in 2018. And from there, I've embarked on the journey of uh, studying abroad. Now, presently, I applied to Clark University in the United States. I got 40% scholarship, which I'm not okay with. Now, what baffles me now, the question I have now, secret to what you've mentioned, I think I'm on the right spot now. What are those things that the, the committee, let me say the, the, the uh, graduate committee used to look at in an applicant, what make a particular application very competitive? Because when I submitted the application, they gave me 40%. And from the, uh, the, the scholarship comments, they said the, comp uh, the, the committee look at the credentials. And after they reviewing the application, I am given 40%. And I know some applicants will be given 100% scholarship. So I'm now like asking, what are those? criteria they are going to look in an applicant, what is going to make my application very competitive to, to gain that full funding scholarship? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, let's hold on. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's Mr. Shekoni. Uh, you are talking about graduate application. That is yes, for, for admission into a higher institution. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, there are certain criteria which is different from what I just presented, but I, yes. I just need to, to help you out to say this. That there are a number of um, points that are awarded to candidates. They will ask you to send your application by December 15. Yes, sir. But it can also be extended to January 15 without telling you you must submit at least a week before the deadline. There is a mark for submission time. Wow. 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 If you don't, there are some that will submit before December 15. Those will be listed as those possibly that will go for funding. If you submit after December, I'm talking of the United States, uh, most universities there. Uh, applications are coming out already now. So when yes. you see that you should submit at a certain time, take out a week or two and ensure that you submit in time and you do a checklist. Don't, don't send your work by piecemeal. If they say mm -hmm. submit your, your, your transcript, ensure that you start right in time. There, there are certain organizations you are supposed to pay to to submit your transcript for interpretation. Pay right in time. Secondly, your qualification is also graded. All, I will give you this one, all certificates coming out of Nigeria 
after 1990, if you are a graduate of any Nigerian universities, Nsuka, Ibadan, Lagos, everywhere, they get uh, prorated again. It is only those who have degrees before 1990 whose qualification will be compared almost in the same line with qualification from, say, um, uh, University of Pennsylvania, Illinois University, Cornell University. But it seems that our certificates have been downgraded towards the end of the 20th century. That if you have any, any certificate and not now, they will ask you to come with a 2-1 to come with a 2-2, they will not even ask you that. What they are asking is your CGPA, which must not be less than 3.0. But exactly. they will accept it if you send in a, a, an application with a CGPA of 2.8, 2.9. But know that you won't have the full mark. That's qualification. Finally, there's what they call SOP. I'm sure you are familiar with SOP. Yes, sir. Now, your SOP is something that you have to write it may not be more than 2,000 words, but you have to write, read, give it to people who are going to help you look at it and make it readable. Mm -hmm. American university system do not require you to quote and quote Aristotle and Plato and to quote Einstein and so on and so forth. You're expected to write yourself into the SOP. If you write yourself into the SOP very well and prove to them why you need that funding, you also have to prove that you need the funding. If you don't prove that you need the funding, if you don't write your SOP very well, if your qualification is not beyond 3.0 CGPA and you do not submit in time, you can be sure that you get anything, maybe less than 50%. Getting 40% means that you're, you, know, you have great potential. Other people get 20%. So 40% is good mark. <laughs> Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you. I'm very All right. grateful, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I, I want to believe that the question was well, well answered. And then for those that are asking for the slides or the the, the recorded session, you can I've, I've already sent a number that you can chat so that you can get that. So I don't know if Professor Umeji is available. Yeah. Okay, Ma. Please, I Ma, must, do give us the yeah. final. I must say thank you very much to the speaker, Professor Raji. Yeah. In fact, I will suggest we do a proposal. Um, write a very good proposal for to. I wonder who will send it to to sponsor his going from university to university, telling them what he has just told us this, um, this afternoon. Because it's very, very important for every university, every researcher, both the students and the lecturers. When we have this with us, then writing for research um, uh, proposals, funding, will be much uh, less uh, stressful or burdensome. So I must say a big thank you very much. Thank you. It's been, it's been so very illuminating. And you all agree with me that um, it's not just only uh, in research, in other areas of our studies, um, this lecture has been very important and stating clearly what we are about to do or what we are doing and what it takes. And it's going to lead one also into entrepreneurship. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Um, then Nenye, I thought you would have allowed that only question, um, allowed him to answer that question. I'm sure he has something to say on it. You know, <laughs> You are trying to cover up for him that he's not a, he's a, in academics and not in mining, but I'm sure he has something there because if you look at him, you will see he's a very versatile person. Look at his face and you agree with me that he's very versatile. He has something to say on that 
uh, question that we also we also benefit benefit from. Um, it is really very touching. I must say, I learned so much I didn't know earlier. So now I'm going to put into practice what I have got from him. And I hope all of us, it has not been a time wasted this afternoon listening to this erudite uh, speaker. And those that um, sniffed around and picked him. Wow. I must say thank you very much, our organizers. I'm sure that uh, Oge Kwenye must have had a hand in it. Mm -hmm. Because that girl is really going places. And I say thank you very much. Colleagues, I'm very proud of you, every one of you. Thank you for this, uh, for the package of this day. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much. Um, for our guest lecturer, I don't know if he, he will still want to say anything with regards to what Prof talked about. <laughs> That's, I don't yeah. know you have any well, I mean, I mean, just so, I mean, just to so thank you for giving me the opportunity to, you know, to speak with, with the audience. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have, I didn't have a sense of the, of the cross section of the audience. How many are uh, full professors? How many are early careers? So that I would have probably even made more intimate presentation, you know, to, you know, for the better. I just hope that uh, if there's any opportunity for me to connect, you know, I was in Enugu two, was it two months ago? Uh, yes. to West Yeah, so I, I move around, you know, just if, if one finds an area of service, you know, to the community, why not? Because I still don't know why we don't have grant writing as a part of our entrepreneurial schemes, you know, for our universities. So that at least there will be some kind of office to train people how to package and present their ideas. And speaking about green energy, uh, green energy will also soon become a thing of the past because as green energy is coming, there's also what is called the blue ray energy. I hope you know about the blue ray energy, marine energy also. So there is a uh, because uh, I mean because I know that when the other person who has a question about green energy was speaking was talking about mining the surface, you know geophysical exploration. But have we even explored that more before we go on be, go on to what is called the blue energy, that is exploring even the seabed, you know, uh, so much resources that God in his infinite mercies have given unto us. Uh, we shouldn't allow international agencies and other people to come and explore these things uh, before we explore it ourselves. So anyway, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share ideas with you. I thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. So on this note, we'll be taking our closing prayer and that will be all for today.